For any new fans watching, I'm the Grand Mixer DXT. And I'm MC Baby T. Just being in the hood was, was the influence being around everybody else. The, the camaraderie of what everyone else was doing as a teenager, you generally want to get involved with at what seems cool. Cool Herc really was the beginning of my introduction into what we're calling hip hop. But as far as music, I was already into music uh, as a child. I grew up in the uh, entertainment family. My mother's a singer. I have an uncle who's a musician. And I, I was uh, raised as a drummer. Um, and so I was already into music. But the, the whole b-boy thing was something that we did even before Cool Herc, but we didn't call it b-boy. And we would say, are you going to get down on the get down part and stuff like that? You know what I'm saying? So we had other terminology. And it was just part of being in the community where it was a fun thing to do. I was 13, and it was bullies. It was bullies that made me stand apart from what they was doing. So instead of fighting, I'd rather talk about it. So it drew me to the mic. Well, DST drove me to the mic. He said, come on, T, we're going to go somewhere. And we went up to a place called Mount Vernon. And that was the beginning of a golden story. We were doing this. We were very young. And we were what people would call entrepreneurs, even I don't use that word, but lack of a better word for now, we were entrepreneurs as teenagers. We were promoting our own shows, our, you know, our own parties. We, we would go and talk to people and, and convince them that they should come and see us because we are the greatest show on earth. So we was, we was Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus as young adults, teenagers. We was already uh, doing that. And that, that, that was my, that's one of my greatest memories of how we would go places where they never heard of what we were doing. And we would just do it. And, and I mean, we was met with resistance, but it would prevail. As you can see that uh, today, it, it permeates throughout the world. I, can, I can't even begin to explain to you what we went through to get people to listen to that music in different neighborhoods. It went extreme, I mean, to violence. You know, there, there, there were homicides, you know, there was attempted homicides, there, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it, was, it made you, you know, mature really quick. And, and it made you, it, it helped me to realize what it is that I really wanted to do because I would stop at nothing. None of that stopped us. And that's the one thing that even as I say it now, it gives me chills because I realized that through all of that, we never stopped. They never scared us away. No matter what, we would come back. And that's, that's one of my greatest memories that I, I know that I was driven and Baby T was driven and we did not fear because we was blessed with the dream of, move, of doing what we were doing and nothing would stop us. We had the stability. It was. It, I think it was more so that the public relied on us. It was like the people was like, "Are y'all gonna have a party tonight? We're coming! Oh my God, where y'all gonna be at?" It was just the excitement of the other people knowing that we was coming back. Yeah, that, it, it, they just never stopped. That, that thinking was our about, high. Right? Are you coming back? What time y'all gonna be there? Where y'all gonna be at? Well, we'll meet you over here if you ain't have car fare to get up there. I'll pay for your cab to get here. So it was just, just overwhelming with success, you know, just to say, well, they felt like this about me for just getting up there talking. After the time I was talking about, I was gonna be on punishment the next day because I was on punishment the next day because I was hanging out to one or two o'clock in the morning. It's an overwhelming to know that people still remember who we are. Right. You understand me? Oh, y'all was the first ones to do this. And that to hear someone say, you are the first to do something, and it's not negative, it's positive. Right. It's just a blessing. The people, that, that they were so mesmerized that they would come up to us and go, well, we are going to play. We're going to be there. Yeah. What, what was that record you was playing? <laughs> you know? yeah. And so that's what made us... That was it. That made us go, we got to come back, the, the people. But yeah. in there was also people who didn't want that right. from those communities. And we fought them physically. They didn't know what it was about. They they, no, no one understood that's, it. That's what it was. They didn't understand. It was, it's like even us as, a, as an adults now. When our kids come to us, it's a new slang 
or the way they dress. Yes. Like we used to wear our Levi's and our sweatshirts with the yeah. right in the corset representing who we was. You know, and it wasn't a bad thing, but if you look at it, you know, we, we was judged. Right. We was truly right. judged. And and it Absolutely. wasn't but the judgment really came is when we when we got up on the stage, he was the DJ and I was the M C and we really gave the people a performance. Right. Because at the end of the day, that's what it was. It was a performance. We didn't know any of these people. Right. We didn't know any of them. Not one person did we know. Right. And so we went into dark territory. We had no idea of how they were going to respond. All we said was, we have something that y'all never seen right. and or heard, and we're going to do it. And Whatever happens, happens. Now, mind you, listen to what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who were listening to disco records. And we came up there with break beats and rhymes. This is the beginning of that. They never heard that before. And this is one mile from the Bronx. Matter of fact, this is on the borderline, not even a mile. This is one block over is the Bronx. One block over is Mount Vernon, New York. And that far away, they had no clue of what was going on in the Bronx. Right. No clue. The two projects, was a, that's about a mile away from each other, exactly. right? No clue of that culture. And we went up there and said, this is what's happening over here. My cousin Todd lives in Mount Vernon. And so he would bring me up there to some of the parties. And I would go, man, they ain't playing no beats up here. They don't have, it was all disco. So I would be sitting there bored, sitting in the gym, right? Now, Vernon wasn't our first stop. New Rochelle, New Rochelle was, was we, our, a boys, near the boys club yeah. was our first stop. Yeah, that's where we, that's where we put the, we planted the flag. Yeah, exactly. We, and then we rolled we, on we, we made, the hill. We made Mount Vernon the home base. Exactly. But we really got it in, in New Rochelle. We kind of skipped over, but we came back. Yeah. We came yeah. back because we had a place called Gobbo's Lounge yes. in in uh, Mount Vernon, but it was a smaller place. But when we hit like mass, mass appeal, Nourishell and how they had never seen that before. And the first time they saw that was Baby T, me, Rob the Gold, City Boy playing outside in, yeah. in, in that first block party yeah. that they ever seen yeah. of that music. And it was like, yo, that blew us away. And that's what it was, to see the look on people's face and the excitement. And, of course, for me, it was the girls. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was the girls. Because, it truly was the girls. Because there were so many of them. And then we began to make friends yeah. with people. It was interesting because we really planned our flag in New Rochelle, but our fr friend base was in Mount wow. Vernon. It was a very interesting thing. Very, we never really made friends in New Rochelle. It was all we had, fans. A hand, we had, right, we had a, a we had few, a few friends. A few. A few, but not like in Mount Vernon. Yeah, Mount well, we Vernon be became our family. Yeah. That's our family. Yeah, we That's built the, an entourage. People, yeah. You know, and it extended over the years to different members came into the group, groups changed, personnel changed, but we are all family. And so that's what we're doing now to bring everyone back together. We had a thing for every day. We had a terry cloth, we might have had a silk, we short, might short. short, short party, a sweatsuit party. We did party. a party for we every had a party for every day. every every a, other week. A, a weekend. t shirt, name t shirt where and, you had to have your name on your t shirt. Exactly. And they were literally And they, they would, would go and do it and, and pay and, to get in and, and be part of it. And I mean it would be, it was it was so the parties Stop. would be so packed huh? that you could touch the walls and you could the sweat. Water. Yes. The water be off the not, wall. Not only was they sweating, but the walls were sweating. sweating. Yep. So we started saying we needed a bigger place. place right? And we got a bigger place. And then more people came. And I the, would look out in the audience and say, oh, my God, all these people come to see me. I know the girls <laughs> come to see you. I, I was partially in and out of my home at the time. Um, I had decided to leave my house uh, because of issues you know, that whole teenage thing, struggle with a single parent. And so I was basically in the streets most of the time. But I, I, the door was always open for me. My mother didn't never really actually threw me out. So I was always able to go. And But I just felt that I, I, I could be more expressive and I can do my thing if I was out in the streets. And so I, I lived with Dennis Pettiford, who is 
who is one of my big brothers. And uh, we call him City Boy. And he's one of the main reasons why all of this happened also. He's, he's one of the key people. And his house was mission control for our group. Baby Herculoids, that was our first name of our first crew. And his house was mission control for all of us. Rob the Gold had already had his own little following up there. And so we connected with him. You know what I'm saying? And then he, and then our connection to him, the collaboration between the two DJs is what made the Baby Herculoids. And then we brought in Baby T and Baby Ace, came with me. We're from the Bronx. And so was he, but he had moved up there. He was partners and a good friend of DJ Smoke, who he called his brother, who, who used to battle Cool Herc. Yeah. So he was in the middle of it. You know what I'm saying? And so we gravitated to him. Believe it or not, most people don't know, the first group I went up there to play with was the Collins Brothers. I put on a record, and they were like, yo, uh, could you take that record off, please? Thank you. We don't particularly care for that kind of music at all. Yeah. <laughs> so they wasn't into it at the time. And he said, man, they, you could play that stuff with me. He said, that ain't, they, ain't up, they ain't into that stuff up here. Yet. Yet. <laughs> Yet. And it, it took us a minute, just a minute, 60 seconds, B, and we had everybody off the chain. Everybody was like, yo, whatever... Whatever those drum beats are, it connected to them. And it, that's some subliminal and some spiritual shit that I'm talking about now. Because it, it, it hit everybody, and you could not deny it once those rhythms hit you. Because I remember it happened to me when I was at a Bambada party. I was just standing there, and something just happened. Just the beats. You know what I'm saying? And so I understood what that was. And that was also part of my drive, because I understood that. Like, man, these the beats. It, it was a tribal thing happening, but in the subconscious, you know? And it reconnected us to shit that happened millions of years ago in our genetic makeup. I was a misunderstood teenager anyway. I was a rebel without a cause, but I had a cause because, you know, <laughs> that was my thing with anything that I did. If I was going to do it, I, listen, I'm going to do this and because I was already singing. So it was, that's not what, that's not what we paid for you to go to singing school for it. An MC, a singer, if, as long as you're talking and a person and you able to connect with someone, that's you getting a message across to them, that's the that's the main key. My my mother didn't really care for the MC and thing because like parties it was always there's so much violence, there's this, there's that. But come to think about it, me any party we had, there was never no confrontations with anyone, no fights, no nothing. You understand me? But like the outside, outside of the party, that may have had been where the friction was. Yeah. You know, people, tensions rise, it's time to go. That's when we and met the resistance. Exactly, the resistance. It was before setting. and after. But my, my family was like, some of my, my kids got to be like, you was an MC. I said, yeah, that was 30 plus years ago. And they said, 30 plus years, 30 what? I said, 37 years ago. She's one of the very first MCs, period, like female MCs, period. And she doesn't get the credit for it because what's happening in the Bronx is the people in the Bronx who take that credit were not aware that hip-hop was going on in other places. And they, they think that it only occurred just where they did it. And that's one of the misunderstandings of the history of hip-hop because because they were there and they only experienced it there and when journalists come to them they only talk about what they know see what I'm saying and journalists only go to interview what they know my mother said she's just a born to be wild child so just let her do it and as, as long as she's not hurting anyone and no one's hurting her everything is fine you know so I had I, it was I kid you not those was the best years of my life I wouldn't change it with anyone, and if I could bring somebody back there to see how it really got started, they would say, wow, wow. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm talking that when I say 37 years, really almost, because this year would be like 38 years. Now, my, I have a grandchild, and my son is rapping. Right. You understand me? So it's, you know, it's like it, it, the times repeats itself in some form or fashion. I would have figured it would have been my daughter, but my son. My mother is a singer, so she understood that drive. I, 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 I you know, I, I assumed that. She understood that. And once she saw that I was deadly serious about what I was doing, 
she created the environment for me to function better in the household. And so we turned my room into yep. <laughs> right? Yes, we did. <laughs> we yep. turned the room into a monastery for music. It was it, you can only go in there if you was a monk of yes, the beats. Yes. That's right. You had to be a beat monk. And your oath and your your seriousness to music and, and creativity had to be deadly serious. Because my mother let us stay in there all day and all night. Like, they thought I was crazy. I'd never, I'd, I stopped coming out of the room. I had no fear. I also grew up in a legalized insane asylum called Eden Wall Projects. I was raised in an environment where... You have to fight. And if that's the day that you get your ass beat, then that's the day that you get your ass beat. But you, you can't run. You can't keep running. You have to stand. You have to stop and fight. Because if you keep running, you're going to keep running. And so for me, that went into effect immediately. And that's why they came at me so hard because I... When these guys, these older guys would come at me, I would just kind of like, okay, whatever. I would try to act like they weren't even there when they were, you know, trying to get at me, right? Yeah. He was there a few times. Yeah. That time when Rico was swinging was, that bat yeah. when I had the thing. He was crazy. Yeah, but you see, I didn't run. Now I just stood, I had a shopping cart, and he was smashing was the shopping cart with, with the records yeah. in it. And I was saying, man, if he hits those records, man, if he hits my records, I'm going to go crazy. off. My records. And this is a grown man. And we, we're 15 and 16 years old. He's in his 20s. And I'm going, why is this guy doing that, man? Like, why is he doing that? But baby Tia tell you, we didn't leave. We didn't yeah, go nowhere. Right back. After a while, he turned around and, and fell into it, too. Yeah. After a while, he yeah. fell into it. He, 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 he succumbed. became like putty in our hands also. Yeah, he, he, he succumbed yeah. to it because he had to. Because everyone around him was like, yo, man. Like that day, yeah. remember? Yeah. They came home and was like, yo, what you doing, man? Won't you leave him alone? You know, because he realized, they realized, like, yo, dude, this guy comes up here to entertain us. What is your problem? It ain't like I took your girl or nothing. Hey. But see, that was part of the problem, too. He, he was get taking, no girl. You was taking their girls. That was no. part of the problem. That's why them guys didn't like you. I didn't have, I didn't have a problem with the guys and the girls because I wasn't looking for nobody. But here's the deal. I didn't take their girls. Well, they was they, they were flocking over they were, you. They liked like me, and so now the women were talking about me. Wow. Instead of talking about their boyfriends, they all were talking about me and yeah. Rob yeah. and it's City Boy, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. And so you're sitting at the table, dinner table with your girlfriend, and she's talking about some other guy. Yes, yeah, You're going to have problems. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so that's what happened. And that happens to any celebrity. No, man. because they was cooking you dinner and all kinds of stuff. They, okay. was doing, they was going out and beyond the cause of duty. Right, they were buying me clothes and oh, stuff. Your brother, let me tell you about your brother. I said, <laughs> oh my goodness. Only if they knew. <laughs> but I never said anything. This one right here, he was my biggest challenge. Because it broke my heart. We had to, like, part. It wasn't bad. I just threw some marshmallows and pennies. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, and you know I'm not lying. Yes, she did. I threw marshmallows and pennies, you know, because I felt like I was getting an unfair shake. But we always remained civil towards each other, you know, no matter what was going on. He, for years, T, come on and do this. T, come on. You know, but then I had, went back to school and started a new life, you know, and had kids. So it kind of stagnated me. Well, he's torn and I'm here. You know, so he went his way, but he never forget. He always called T oh, or, or write me, T, what you doing? What's going on? Yeah. So we always kept in contact, which was a beautiful thing. Because you got some people that make it and they forget yeah. about the people where they started from. Right. But he always kept in contact with me, so which was a beautiful thing. But other than that, I, um, skies was the limits for me at the time when I was doing what I was doing. I enjoyed it and. Like I said, I went and traded in for the world. That was a difficult time period, and it was a transition that unfortunately led to changes that was based on majority rule at that time, because now I was dealing with people who were coming in, bringing their works.
that suggested that I had to respect their position. And so I was like, okay, I'm no longer dealing with the MC world. You got that? I'm focusing on this. And the changes that were made were made, and I had to go along with it because I was outnumbered. It's me and you are more like brothers it's and sisters, sisters right, right, right. than like a friend or whatever. And, and you know, I've, I've been in this game with you for a long time. The beginning. Even from the beginning. Yes. Like I, even what her last year told me, I have to take my hat off to UT because you are a true icon. Right. right. So now I could take it back to my own glory. Because once you hear it from somebody that literally started it, we're here, but he started it someplace else. See, you may be the king of this here. But he's the king of that there, right? So that that was the whole thing. Yeah. And like I, t I was telling him, I said, but you remember because when Smoke, uh, when Hurt started too, it was him and Smokey, Smokey. and the Smokertrons. Right. So I, I said, don't let me, because I could break down the whole MC DJ history to you, right? Because that's what makes me different and unique from any other MC. See, it's, there's a rapper and then there's an MC. You have to know the two. A rapper is yes, yes, sure, to the beat, sure, and you don't stop. Now, an MC is this. I'm introducing the grand mixer DST on oh, right, the right. wheels of steel. That's MC, right. right? So, people, the corroboration between the two is that you have to know when you're rapping and when you're MC, right? right? So, that that's like when I tell her, I said, y'all didn't have MCs, right? Y'all just was DJing. So, when he came out with an MC, that made him unique, right? He went off and did his thing. And like I said, I take my hat off to him. He had to leave all of us in order to get to where he's going. So it, this really wouldn't even be in existence right. had he wouldn't have did what he had to do. Right. And then he talked about all the things from the past and brought it to Fort Light, right? And then you get up on the bandstand and then you forget like the other people that was around you, you yeah. can't do that. Yeah, I I'm not. I can't bring everybody, but I can talk about what I know because I was there. You understand what I'm saying? I right. can only tell you what me and him has been through, and we have been through a lot. lot. You understand yeah. me? A lot. When I say a like, lot... Where I'm going now is to tell the story from the beginning because everyone is misunderstanding what actually happened. And unfortunately, like I said, I'm bumping heads with other members of our family because they don't understand the lineage and they have the chronolog the chrono the, it's not chronologically accurate and they're basing it off of that inconsistency of the inaccuracy of the chronological line and I'm trying to help them to understand that so that they can begin to tell the story based on where they, where, started. Where they started off at that makes sense to the dot that happened before them because today just today we're banging heads and I'm like you have to understand if you walk into a gym to do an event and the place is packed back to back and the walls are sweating and that's the first time your name is on that flyer logic and deduction will tell you something has been going on here before, before you, you got, got there here. You see what I'm saying? And this is what I'm trying to explain, explain to some of my brothers and sisters who's thinking that, you know, all of that happened because of them. And I love them, and so I'm trying to help them to understand. There's a history that is more, is more important that you understand the whole history, not just for our group, but for the whole hip-hop legacy, that everyone begins to tell their story accurately and chronologically correct because once the dots are out of focus and out of line, it destroys the whole history and the and lineage is yeah. incorrect. And so that's what we're doing now. We are, we are in the painstaking process of correcting the timeline of the entire existence of that first generation of the hip-hop culture so people have a very clear understanding of what actually happened. Because what's in 99.9% .9 of those books that people are getting their degrees from are inaccurate. Inaccurate. And I can prove that now irrefutably. And I can, I can, I can debate any person who holds a degree in hip-hop, doctorates, masters, bachelors, or anything. I can debate them and snatch their, snatch their <laughs> piece of paper or ask them to hand it back and rescind their doctorates or their masters because it's in it's it's invalid 
It's invalid based on the academia that they have used to, to, to get their doctorates and their degrees. It's all incorrect. I can now prove that irrefutably. 1520 Cedric Avenue. When you walk out that door, there's a street, and then there's some grass, and then there's the river. That's as west as you can get in the Bronx. That's where Cool Herc did his very first party. Somehow the South Bronx, and I can tell you how, and this is something that I, I was saving for my book, but I think everyone should know this now. When most of the journalists who came into New York to interview the whole hip-hop scene were from Europe. They were European journalists, and, and, and un, subconsciously racism played into that because they have immediately thought that it happened in the most messed up areas of New York. 1520 is not broken down, burnt down, abandoned no, billions. It was not. So they went into those areas. And when you talk to people who are trying to attach themselves to a culture that they know very little of, but they can get the credit for, they're going to take it. Education of history plays a major role in that too. Lack of education, understanding what, how important it is to tell history correctly. You see what I'm saying? And so that happened. And then everyone started, it became an onslaught. And then what happened is the artists who were from those areas said, man, they talking about me and my man wants to get in to make sure he's part of the history. Everyone wants to become part of this history. It becomes a phenomenon. But they're not realizing that it's inaccurate. The timelines are not adding up. People are predating themselves when they started. And it doesn't add up. So now it's become a game of musical chairs. And, I, and I'm starting that game because when the music stops, it's going to be a date on that chair. And that date is going to be connected to a release date of a record that occurred during the time that you said you start. And that's going to be connected to a, a date on a flyer. See what I'm saying? And so there's no way that you can predate yourself because the numbers don't lie. Only people do. Right. Well, I can tell you this. The parties that we had cost more than two dollars, so I know it had to be a long time ago. Cause any party <laughs> I go to now is twenty, twenty to twenty-five dollars. Yeah, our parties. Were I'm a just dollar, saying, it's back then. You, you, I'm, I kid you not. It was a dollar, two dollars, two dollars and fifty tops. cents to get in. So I, I mean, we actually had fifty. We had fifty cents. Now a dollar fifty. Now I'm not gonna lie. When you start moving down to Roxy's and stuff like that, yeah. it got a little, you know, little steep. Or maybe when I went to Studio 54. Yeah. But I'm just saying that the parties that when we went back in the 70s when we started, it was a dollar. It was I had to buy original yeah. one. It was a dollar. To prove it. One time I got a pair of sneakers, Renee. We went to Delancey Street, mm -hmm. and Renee bought Renee bought me a pair of sneakers. Cause we were broke. We didn't have no money. But we. And, and that's what and I we did. didn't care. I was, but I, no, I didn't. I didn't care. I had fun. Fun. I had fun. I, 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 you're I, a female. After, so a while, after a while, I can't, at, at the beginning, for the first couple of years, it was cool. But then after a while, I said, wait, somebody's getting paid a lot of money. Because there you. is thousands of people out there. I kid you not. It was thousands. One night, I think. Yeah, but got, at a dollar, it's a thousand dollars. Yeah, but, but I'm just saying, <laughs> sure, where's my up there? I'm getting hoarse. But no, it wasn't a dollar up at the boys' club. It became 250 yeah, it's old. It was $2.50. But we found out that, right. this, that, that that guy, Fuzzy, okay. him and the other guy was taking all the money. Oh, okay. Because I saw well, that guy years later. You know what he said to me? He said, he said, hey, what's up, man? What's up, DST? Yeah, man. You know, I bought my first two cars from you guys doing shows. Wow. First two cars. First two cars. And that was just him. He didn't say what Fuzzy bought. <laughs> right. You because know. I mean, the walls. Like and I, I didn't said, care. I was like, man, go ahead. You good, man. You know. I'm, well, we had a good time. We had That's a great we could time. Say. We had a good time. We had one other MC. Well, actually two, but really, uh, Baby T was the central main MC. We had Baby Ace, who was our sister. She's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Who would accompany her? Accompany her from time to time. And we had Bingo Rock, who was also did his thing here and there. You know, but the main MC was Baby T. I want to add to that because in the research that we're doing, we, we discovered that, you know, the whole MC thing goes back much further than what we know. And so we know that also toasting came from Jamaica, from the Jamaican DJs who would sit. If you went to see Cool Herc in the beginning, they didn't stand up. They were sitting down and they had the mic in the boom stand and they would toast and Coco Rock would toast. You know, we, we also know that, you know, there was there was uh, 
Jocko and these radio personalities who were doing these forms of rhyming. Right. But they weren't in the Bronx. And we didn't know. We were young. So we didn't connect to that. And so now that we're learning about these other uh, people who were doing these rhymes, like Cab Calloway, right. Heidi Heidi Ho, right. these were all rhymes, but we didn't make the connection. Then we discovered Pig Meat Markham. Here comes right. the judge, and I got the number. Who's rhyming? Straight up hip-hop style. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so now we have to rethink these things. Before, before we can answer a question that you ask, really, these things have to be re rethought yeah. because it, it, we've discovered that something had occurred even before the, the, the generation of, 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 even us. Of, of what we call MCing. There was something that had already happened but was lost and forgotten, right. and now we have reconnected it. We reconnected to it, and we're, we're, we're researching it now so that we can have a better understanding of the lineage. It doesn't start in 77. It's much older. Right. The, what starts in the 70s is the tech, technological aspect of what we're calling hip-hop because of the technology of the time enabled the person to set up two turntables and a mixer in a club. You know, not in a radio station. And so, but the spoken word aspect of it is connected to a lineage that that existed before our grandparents. It goes on thousands of years. And we're beginning to see the connection. We're beginning to find people who were doing it at earlier times. And so that's a question that that uh, is open right now. <laughs> right, that's just like my kids ask me, Mom, for real, what is hip-hop? I said, hip-hop ain't just someone emceeing right. or DJing. It's a style of fashion. It's a style of writing. It's a style of dancing. It's like a combination of all of these things. You know, a hairstyle. Oh, she's punk. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, that's, you know, even a baseball cat can be part of a hip-hop culture. You understand? Skateboarding is part of hip-hop, whether people know it or not, because they moving. You know what I mean? Just like even, like how you said, even with the MC, how they was in the booth doing their thing. You know, somebody's rocking, so they dancing. They getting that groove, that like how you say that central thing from our four ancestors. Right, right, you right, understand right. me? They moving like even to 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 get a message across to somebody else. You have to be able to speak to them, right. articulate. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? And, and that so, went on for thousands of years. Yes. And what was you know because of because of our condition in this country in in America as descendants of of uh, you know the people who created mathematics and the sciences and all of that and then to become slaves and all of this history ripped from us and then we reconnect through rhythms and rhymes nice. through some sort of power of expression yes. you know it's it's a deep thing you know and so it's it's dangerous for us to sit here and say well 1970 it started because that what that does is it causes us to cut ourselves cut off again right. you know right. what I'm saying from that lineage that we've now discovered through beats and rhymes, right. and so that's this is a a question that you have to come back after we further out well, our I research. Kid, I kid you not, because I always did nursery rhymes, so I know they've been here forever. My most proud moment is is didn't happen yet. It is to see the whole family, from the baby Herculoids to the Infinity Four, all in one room at a table together, talking and learning. What all of us had brought together to put me where I got to. Because without none of them, I would not be sitting here talking to you about any of this. And so that would be my most proudest moment. Um, what I'm most proud of is the people that has been in my life. That has in, in, in intervened in my life to get me to where I'm at. That's the most proudest moment. What I want people to remember is that, you know, shed, grind. You know, you're only as good as how you practice. You are who you are based on what you contribute your energy and your time to. And your su success is only when you can help someone else. Well, I am a legacy. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, I may not be a legacy in the Bronx, but Mount Vernon, I hold that throne. I don't got no old with it, but I still take my hat off to them. Because that's to me was the beginning of the ending for me. You understand me? I came, I conquered, and I see.